Today, we, um, we first will um, give a recap of what we uh, did last lecture, and then uh, we'll see how it goes, but I'm hoping to um, discuss financial markets and, uh, in particular, money markets. So, just as a reminder, we're still in the short run, okay? And this is what we focused on uh, last time. So, we understand that in the short run, equilibrium output or equilibrium GDP or the level of um, GDP is determined mainly by changes in aggregate demand or total demand. And last lecture, we decomposed these, this aggregate demand or total demand into um, different components based on different economic agents. We explained how aggregate demand is or consists of consumption, which is what households spend on um, goods and services, plus what firms or businesses uh, spend on investment. So when they uh, buying a new machine or um, buying a new house or all these sort of fixed investment. Um, within, we, we also added the government spending. So government intervened the economy by um, setting the fiscal policy, which has two components, um, government spending on one side and taxes on the other side, taxes and uh, government transfers. So G here, or government spending, or the government sector is one of, again, one of the economic agents that uh, interact in the market with other agents to uh, determine the um, overall economic outcome, which we highlighted in the first lecture. Plus the outside world, which mainly refers to exports and import. So net, we called net exports, which is the difference between exports and, and, um, and imports. So if exports are more than imports, that means you have a, a trade surplus. If exports are less than net expo um, less than imports, that then you have trade deficit. But then last time we just assumed that we are in a closed economy where there is no um, exports or imports, or meaning exports equal imports equal zero. So just to make things simpler, so what we have discussed last time is mainly based on three sectors or um, households, uh, firms, and um, uh, government. So we start looking at each one of those components and we show some data from the United States and from the, the UK, and we show that um, consumption is probably the largest component in aggregate demand. So we were interested to understand what determines um, these components, especially consumption, uh, which will help us understand the um, equilibrium output or equilibrium uh, GDP. So we started with the consumption function and we show that the consumption function has two components, if you remember. Um, one which is autonomous uh, consumption. So autonomous means here it doesn't depend on income. And we call that uh, C0. Plus another component which mainly depends on uh, disposable income. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a positive related to um, disposable income. And we explain disposable income here means um, income minus uh, taxes and government transfers. So, so basically what is available uh, to be spent on 
uh, consumption or goods and, and, and services. Um, a very important compo a very important concept we we looked we looked at, which is the uh, slope of the uh, consumption function, um, is the marginal propensity to consume, which um, we call C1, and this is a very important concept because if income increased by 100 uh, million uh, pounds and consumers or households spend 80 million out of this 100 million pound increase in income, if they spend that in consumption, that means the marginal propensity to consume is 80% or 0.8. So how about the other part, which is what, what remains here is 20 uh, uh, million pound. These basically go to savings. So which makes the marginal propensity to save 20%. So the sum of both, so they should add up to 100% or one. Okay, marginal propensity to consume and marginal propensity to, to save. So we made some assumptions. We assume that investment is exogenous. When we explain what we mean by an exogenous variable, exogenous variable means it is not determined within the model, so it's kind of, you take it as given. So in, in the last lecture, we treated um, investment as exogenous. We treated also government spending as exogenous. So these two variables were exogenous. And also, we made a very important assumption, which will lead us to the equilibrium condition, uh, which is that firms hold no inventories. So if firms hold no inventories, so that means the output or the equilibrium output or the equilibrium condition will be that uh, when production equal demand or equal aggregate demand. Again, these are the components. We assume that aggregate demand equals C plus I plus G. These are the three sectors because we assume that there is no um, outside world or this is a closed economy. So from there, we could also, we show also that we could um, state the equilibrium condition as the relationship between investment and saving. And we show that in the second part of the lecture that um, you could reach the same equilibrium uh, equation. So you, you could reach the same equation uh, as you see on the, on the screen using the um, or stating the uh, equilibrium condition as investment equal, um, equal savings. So, and this is what we, we reached here. So we have um, y equal one over one minus C1. Again, C1 here is the marginal propensity to consume. Um, so the blue part, if you can see that, so which is one over min, uh, one minus C1 is the uh, multiplier. Uh, and we explain what that means, and I'll, I'll repeat it in a few seconds. And then the, the, the red part here is the autonomous spending. So again, which means this is part of demand that is not uh, dependent on, uh, on income. Um, and then multipliers uh, here, which is again, it's one over one minus C1. The size of this multiplier depends on the value of the marginal propensity to consume, which is C1. So that means um, uh, uh, when C1 is closer to one, obviously C1 cannot be uh, more than one, so it's between zero and one. So if you have um, C1 that is closer to one, that means a larger uh, uh, size for the multiplier. And also that means it will take more rounds to, to adjust. So it will take longer uh, time to to adjust to um, or more rounds of adjustment until we we, we, we we reach the equilibrium output. What I tried to um, I explained last time by giving an example how how much um, or how the, the the adjustment work. So if you remember, we said if you if income increased by hundred million pounds and the um, the marginal propensity to consume were, was um, 0.8, that makes the multiplier 5. So that means the total effect 
is going to be 100 pound, 100 million pound, the initial increase in whatever part of the autonomous um, spending could be um, autonomous consumption, could be government spending. And actually that's, that's uh, very important because that's what the government control is, uh, how much they spend. Okay, and as I said before that, um, explain the uh, fiscal policy, what type of fiscal policy the government applies. It's, it's basically because they can change government spending, they can change what they spend, and they can change taxes as well. So if we assume we have an expansionary fiscal policy, meaning that the government will spend more money. So spending more money, just remember G here, between brackets means this is uh, part of the autonomous spending. So this initial increase was 100 million pound and the propensity, uh, the marginal propensity to consume was 0.8, that makes the multiplier five, so that means the total effect on output should be 100 pound times five, times the multiplier. I actually created this Excel sheet, which I'm going to upload uh, on Blackboard. So, so basically what it shows us, it shows us different values for the marginal propensity to consume from 0.1 to 0.9 and how much the multiplier will be. And this is the initial increase in, in the government spending. So this is an expansionary uh, physical policy by, in, by increasing G by uh, 100 million bound in the first round. And this is how much the effect will be in the second round. So obviously, if the marginal propensity to consume was 90%, so that means people will spend 90% uh, of this 100 pound on income. So that means income will increase by, so they spend by, uh, spend 90, 90 pound will save 10 pound. So that means income will increase by 90 pound and that will go on because in the second round or in the, in the following round, that means those who receive the 90 pound will spend 81 pound or save nine pound and that will carry on until this effect will disappear. And as you see here, this is exactly so this is the sum of these rounds. So it's nearly uh, 1,000 pounds, which you could actually get this from, from here by just multiplying 10, which is the multiplier, times the initial amount, which is 100. So rather than calculating this, all these rounds until this even still hasn't uh, been zero now, so still there's some impact here. But if you carry on, this was nearly 1,000, here was like 500 because the multiplier was uh, five, again, because the marginal propensity consumed was 0.8. So that makes the multiplier five. So if the initial increase was 100, so 100 times five, that gives us 500. So you didn't need really to do all this calculation, okay? But just to show an example of different, obviously, as I said before, so if you have a smaller uh, marginal propensity consumed, that means you have a smaller uh, multiplier and obviously the effect will be small uh, or the total effect will be will be small as a result. So this is the idea of the multiplier and then we we show how um, um, to, to uh, plot this to to say the same thing using uh, a graph. Uh, one thing I mentioned last time uh, which was the 45 degree line. So remember when we started to show the equilibrium on a graph, we showed that we had income in the horizontal axis and production and aggregate demand on the vertical axis. So one thing I said is the 45 degrees line show that show all the points where both whatever you measure on the horizontal axis and whatever you measure on the vertical axis are equal. So this is just a very simple thing to show you. So what I've just I made up some, some numbers. So just income is 100 from 100 to 1,000, the same thing for production. And I just tried to plot this. This gives us exactly the 45 degrees line. So going back to what we, we did uh, last time, just very quickly, just to show you what I mean here. So once we have this, so remember we had income here, 
and we have the uh, production here, and then this line, which again, every point here, basically, whatever you measure here equals whatever you measure here. So, and then the aggregate demand function started from some point here because it doesn't equal zero, because remember, there's autonomous component, which we highlighted between brackets. So this, so this is the aggregate demand here. And the equilibrium will be that point where, so we agree that this 50, 45 degrees line, it, every point on this line means that income equals production. So this is, this is where, the, this is the equilibrium condition. So what we want to do now is to find the point where that aggregate demand function intersect with the 45 degrees line, which means at this point, your, the production equals the, um, equals the uh, uh, aggregate demand, and that was, the, that was our equilibrium condition. So that's everything we actually discussed last time. So what I want to, um, and just by the way, I, I uploaded a video, a short video, to show you how to drive this equation again. I did it by hand, so from the beginning to the end. So it should be very, very straightforward. So if, if you still have any question about that, just let me know. So the equation I'm talking about is this one. So of course, if you, if you click on this link here, it will take you to the video and it's also, uh, it's online now. So this, this equation, how to drive this equation using the, uh, what we learn about the consumption function and um, using the equilibrium uh, 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 condition as well. So, so moving from here, so what, what we discussed so far is related to the uh, goods market. So what we want to discuss next is financial markets. And in particular, what I want to focus on today is um, the demand for money. So um, how, interest, how the interest rate is determined, so the money market equilibrium, and mon monetary policy in instruments. So, starting with the first part, which is demand for money. Um, so money is, is, is a, you can think of money as, as an asset that's very liquid. So something that you can use for transactions um, so you can use as means of payment, but in the same in the same time it doesn't pay you uh, any interest in return. Um, so what we can call money here is or goes beyond just uh, notes or coins. It actually also includes uh, demand deposits or the current account deposits, things that you can use uh, for transaction. And and that means we could have different uh, definitions of what we mean by money, okay? So again, so money, just don't think of money as the uh, cash or the notes you, you hold in your, in your wallet. Uh, money also includes so many things beyond that. So that's why we have different definitions of money. Um, so one, of, one, one is the um, uh, narrow money, which includes uh, notes, coins, and demand deposits. And this in the UK is called M0, okay? Um, in other countries, it might be like coins and notes are defined as M0 if you add uh, demand deposits that will give you M1. So if you add other uh, time deposits, that will give us the broad money or what we call the broad money. So, so there are different definitions. So, but at the end of the day, we, we understand that, okay, money is a very liquid asset. So liquid here or liquidity here means that you can use um, in transactions. Um, so you're moving, when you define money, you're moving from the narrow definition to the broad definition based on how liquid that is. So starting from notes and coins, this is the most liquid form of money, okay? Then moving toward um, uh, demand deposit or current account deposit, 
okay? That's still more liquid than time deposits. So that's why as you move to the uh, less liquid uh, 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 form of money, that will move us toward the uh, broad definition of money. But we know, again, we know that, okay, money pays no interest rate. So you don't, you don't, you don't earn any, or you don't receive any interest rate if you hold money. But at the same time, it is fully, uh, a, a fully liquid asset, which means that you can use it to make payment uh, without, in no time and without losing uh, its value. On the other side, bonds, which could be another alternative where you can hold, or another form where in which you can hold your uh, financial wealth. So bonds pay positive interest rate. So when you hold bonds, you, you receive interest rate. Uh, but in, on the other side, it can't be used for transactions. So you can't use bonds to buy and um, to buy uh, goods and services. Okay, so it is not liquid like uh, money. So what we're going to think about today, we're going to think about these two forms, uh, money and bonds, as kind of alternatives or some different forms that we can um, store our financial uh, wealth in. So that's why we broadly define financial markets or divide financial markets into, so the whole financial market is broadly uh, divided into two sub, uh, sub markets, money markets and uh, bonds markets. So money market is important. We, it's important for us to understand and study money market because um, central banks um, implement their monetary policy by actually changing the supply of money. Okay? So if they want to follow an expansionary uh, monetary policy, so that means they need to or they would be aiming to increase money supply. If they want to follow or apply a contractionary policy, then that means they will um, reduce the uh, supply of money. So the idea here, okay, so uh, this is very important segment or component in um, the economy. And uh, bond mar bonds market where interest rate is determined. So it's very important for us to understand how interest rate is determined, especially at the end you will see here today that interest rate is also one of the instrument that, uh, one of the policy instrument that central banks use to um, set their um, uh, monetary policy. So, um, as I said before, so let's just think of these two as two different forms in which you can uh, store your um, financial wealth, though we'll assume that financial wealth is split between money and bonds, and we understand these are, no, are not perfect substitutes, and we, we understand the differences now. So we know that, okay, um, money is more liquid than, than bonds, but money pays no interest uh, while bonds do, okay? So just keep that, uh, keep that in mind. So what we will do today, we basically, because we understand that equilibrium in one market implies equilibrium in the other market, <coughs> we will focus mainly today on uh, money markets. Okay? So when we talk about money markets, just think of money as, as a good, as any other good. So how the price of money is determined in the market so basically, you have demand and supply. So if we understand the demand side and the supply side, then this will help us to understand the equilibrium in the money market. Okay? So this is what I want to, to focus on um, for the rest of this lecture. So first, which is the demand side. So the question is, why do we uh, need money? There are three reasons people demand money. 
So one, which is the most obvious reason why uh, you want money, is because of transaction demand. So basically, you want to make payments, you want to buy goods and services, and obviously this component or this uh, factor is positively related to your income, meaning if um, income in the economy if, uh, has increased, so that means more transactions, that means more demand for money because of transaction. Okay? So this is positively related to income. So this is one reason. The other reason is precautionary demand uh, just to face uncertainty. And this part or this component uh, or this factor is negatively related to the interest rate. Okay? Just think of the interest rate here as uh, the opportunity cost of holding cash. Okay, or holding money. So if you, if, you, if you hold money, that means you're losing the interest rate that you would have received if you decided to hold bonds rather than money. Okay, so in that case, we would imagine that there's kind of negative relationship, of, if I can say, between the uh, precautionary demand and interest rate because interest rate is the opportunity cost of uh, holding money. The third reason, which is the uh, speculative demand, so sometimes they said we can spend or we can invest on um, interest uh, bearing assets like bonds, and uh, as I said, you would imagine that this relationship is negatively, uh, so speculative demand uh, for money is negatively correlated with um, with interest rate. So when, when there's high interest rate, that means uh, or implies that low uh, bonds price, which means, as I said before, the, 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 the cost or the opportunity cost of, of um, holding money is higher, again, just because money doesn't pay you interest. Okay? So you wouldn't receive interest when you... Um, uh, when you hold money, okay? So, so which that take us? Remember, we, we, we split the financial market into money market and bonds market. We said we want to focus on uh, the money market and to understand the equilibrium in the money market, you just need to understand both sides, demand for money and money supply, okay? If we understand what determines these two sides, then it takes us to the equilibrium. So, so far we're looking at the demand for money. So, the demand for money, for money now, from what we said now, so we, have, we, 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 we talked about three reasons, transaction demand, precautionary demand, speculative demand. Mm -hmm. So, that means, so the transaction demand uh, means this is positive related to income. So, nominal income, which is, think of it as a measure of the level of transaction in the economy. So as I said before, if at a higher income level, so you would imagine that there are more transactions and that means more demand for money because of that reason. So that's, uh, that's positively related to demand for money. And the other factor here is interest rate. Okay, so it's a decreasing function of interest rate, meaning that um, when interest rate is high, then there's lower demand for, uh, for money. Okay, so kind of going over the direction. So we can um, represent this as uh, this function here. So uh, MD here is the demand for money. And we have two components here or two factors here. Uh, this sign dollar we explained in the first lecture, whenever you see sign dollar before Y, that means this is nominal uh, income. Okay, so and the relationship between uh, this nominal income and uh, demand for money is positive. So as I said, so if income, nominal income increases, that means more transactions, that means de more demand for money because of transaction. The second part, which is, again, it's the interest rate. The negative sign here just tells us that there's a negative um, 
correlation between or negative relationship between uh, the interest rate and uh, demand uh, for money. So an increase in the interest rate will decrease the, um, the money uh, uh, the demand for money, as we explained before, that because that means more people will um, put their uh, wealth into, into bonds rather than money because they will receive the high interest rate. Okay, so we could represent this graphically. We, we, we said last time, um, as a macroeconomist, you, could, um, you have tools to explain your model. Um, one is to use algebra, the other one is to use uh, graphs. So as a graphical representation of this relationship, so what we have here, we have money on the horizontal axis and the interest rate on the vertical axis. And we know that, so this is the relationship between the demand for money and interest rate. And no, this, this relationship is negative. So that means this curve should be downward slope uh, uh, um, curve, which is what we see now. So, because, um, so if for different levels of I or interest rate, that means you're moving on um, the same uh, 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 demand for money curve. But if income, nominal income has changed, you don't see nominal income on either um, axis, so that means this is something outside this relationship, so that means it, it will definitely cause a shift in, um, in the uh, 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 demand um, for money curve, and that, that means the MD curve, and that means if nominal income increase, that means the whole care will shift to the right. Okay? So, again, why would the care shift to the right? Because the change on, uh, of uh, nominal income. So, different levels of interest rate at the same or at a given um, nominal income. So, that means you'll be moving on the same um, curve. But if uh, nominal incomes change, in this example, what you see on the screen is uh, an increase in nominal income. So that means this will move to the right, will shift the whole uh, curve uh, to, to the right. And again, that means at the same or for the same uh, level of uh, interest rate, you would have more demand for money. And why? Why would we expect that more demand for money? Remember, because one of the factors we talked about is the transaction demand. So higher income, higher level of nominal income means um, people will demand more money for transaction. And that's exactly what you see on the screen now. So having this shift to the right because of an increase of uh, nominal income, um, that means um, more demand for money here. And again, we understand that because of transaction demand. So this is, this is the um, one side, okay? Remember, we started with uh, financial markets, we split this into two, or we divided this into two markets. We said we'll focus on money markets and we want to understand equilibrium in, in the money markets. And to understand equilibrium in any market, you need to understand demand and supply, okay? So we started with the first side. Now we'll move to the second side. So just before I move to the supply side, I hope now the demand side is very clear. So what did we say? All what we said about the demand side, there are three reasons why you would need money. Transaction demand, and then uh, uh, precautionary demand, and speculative demand. So we have two factors that can determine this demand for money. One is nominal income, and it's positively related, um, and interest rate. Okay, to plot the demand for money curve, so we plot the relationship between money uh, or demand for money and interest rate. And this is a downward slope curve. And if you change for any given nominal uh, 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 income, 
um, you basically, and you change the interest rate, you're basically moving on the same curve. But if nominal income itself has increased or has changed, that means this will shift the whole uh, curve either to the right if demand, oh, sorry, if nominal income has increased, or to the left if nominal income has uh, decreased. Okay, so um, now let's think of equilibrium now. So, but before I think of equilibrium, really I need to understand uh, money supply. In this analysis, we take money supply given by central banks because monetary authorities or central banks, they decide what to do with uh, money supply. So in this sense, money supply will be treated as exogenous to us here in this model, okay? It's given by central banks, okay? So that's why we will plot on the same axis, we will plot money supply as a vertical line because it's independent, it's not related to interest rate, it's actually given by uh, central banks. So central banks decide how much money to inject in the economy, so this is, um, so to our model, it's actually, it's exogenous. And we explain what that means, it, it is determined outside the model, and in this case, it's determined by central banks. So we take it as given, and that's why we'll call money supply, M is here means uh, money supply equal M. So M is just a constant, or some kind of given uh, level of uh, money supply. Equilibrium, equilibrium in any market, very simple, so when demand equals supply, so or when supply equals demand, so we have equilibrium here would happen in the money market requires that money supply equals the demand for money equals M, and M here, again, we're taking it as exogenous because we know that central banks decide, um, or we, take, we took uh, the money supply provided by central banks as given. So the condition is very simple, so Equilibrium in the money market happens when uh, money supply equals demand uh, for money. So remember we said we, because this is exogenous, so it's not related really, but it, it's not related to the interest rate. So here this level is given uh, by central banks. So that's why when we plot the money supply curve, we plot a vertical uh, line, so it's not really related by um, the interest rate, and it's just giving to this analysis, or it's giving to us, and that um, an equilibrium here will be at the point where this two, uh, money supply and demand for money curves uh, intersect, which is this point A, and that will determine the level of uh, uh, money, M here, and the level of interest. So think of the interest rate here as the price of money. Okay, so it's demand and supply, and this is just easy like any uh, other good, and you have a good old money, and this is the equilibrium between demand and supply, and this is the price of money, which is the interest rate. Okay, so <clears throat> the equilibrium in the money market now is, isn't, uh, uh, um, uh, I think it's clear now, So, but, but now let's just think of what would change this uh, situation. So there are two reasons now, or one of two reasons if they happen, this, this level of interest rate might change, and also the money, uh, uh, money supply. So we've got one, if, um, if, we, if, if there's a nominal income, nominal income increased, so we said that demand for money will shift to the right. Or if nominal income decreases, that means demand for money curve will shift to the left. Okay? Obviously, that will, will change the interest rate. And also, if central banks decided to change money supply. So if uh, central banks decided to uh, increase money supply, so that means that straight line, that vertical line, will shift to the right. And if central banks decided to reduce money supply, that vertical line will shift to the left. And that will tell us what would happen to the interest rate. So the first case, looking from the demand side, which we really understand, if nominal income has increased. 
That's the case you see on the screen now. So the effect of uh, an increase in uh, nominal income, how that will affect interest rate, okay? So remember, money supply is given by the central bank, so this vertical line is not going to move, and the effect of the change in nominal income will be reflected in a shift of, uh, in, in, in the demand for money curve, shift to the right because the change here was an increase in uh, nominal income. So when, when this, sorry, when this shift to the right, so that means where's the equilibrium now? The new equilibrium point is A prime, which give us uh, a higher level of uh, interest uh, rate. So this is where the equilibrium is set in the market. Okay, so how, because we, we're going to talk about how this will change, how interest rate will change if money supply itself change, so that vertical line moves, this is actually the job of central banks. Okay, so central banks uh, set their monetary policy or manage monetary policy by basically changing money supply. So we will see how this uh, work now. So as we said, central banks set the monetary policy by adjusting the level of money supply, and that's why we call money supply here um, a monetary policy instrument. Okay. <coughs> um, so for, for a given uh, money, uh, demand for, for money curve, um, if, if the central bank decided to increase money supply, then this vertical line will shift to the right. And if they decided to reduce money supply, this, this vertical line will shift to, to, to the left. And this, of course, will, will change the equilibrium interest rate. So if, if the central bank increased the money supply and the vertical line shift to the right, that means the equilibrium interest rate will fall. And if um, the central bank decided to reduce money supply, and that means the vertical line or the money supply line will shift to the left, and that means the interest rate, uh, the equilibrium interest rate will, will increase. So this is an example to show exactly what I was talking about. So here, an example of an expansionary policy where the central bank decided to increase or expand the interest rate from, uh, sorry, the, the, the money supply from M to M prime. So that means this vertical line shifts to the, the right. The initial equilibrium for the interest rate was at A, which is I level here, this, this I. And now after, um, increasing money supply, the new equilibrium point became A prime, and that gave us a lower level of uh, interest rate. So that means um, the interest rate will fall as, as a result of an expansionary uh, monetary policy, meaning that the, the central bank decided to expand or to increase their, uh, uh, the money supply. Um, how, how, do, how do central banks do that? How do they increase or decrease money supply? Okay, so we, we, we dealt with or we treated money supply as, as given. We said this is given by central banks, but we really want to understand how do central banks do that. So central banks do this, changing money supply. So again, this is the essence or the, the core of monetary policies, changing money supply. How do central banks do this? So central banks do this through open market operations, so they... Uh, go in the bond market and they sell or buy bonds, okay? So, if they want an expansionary monetary policy or increase or expand money supply, so basically they would buy bonds. So when they buy bonds, they take bonds and they give money, okay? They print money. Okay, so that means they, they increase the money supply. The other way, if they want ex a contractionary uh, policy, that means they will sell. So they enter the um, uh, bonds market to sell uh, bonds. So it's it's very so this this will will explain how this shift happen here. Okay. So if they buy, 
bonds, that means they're expanding or increasing money supply. If they, so we, we, this line will shift to the right. If they sell bonds, that means they, um, money supply will, will, will fall. That means this curve or this line, uh, this vertical line will shift to the left. Okay? And now we understand how this will affect interest rate, of course. So <coughs> this is just an example of the uh, balance sheet of, of the central bank. And it shows that um, bonds here um, are on the asset side, while money uh, is on the liabilities uh, side. And it shows you on the second part, this part here, it shows the effect of an expansionary uh, policy where they increased money supply by uh, 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 buying bonds. So which means you'll see here one million uh, dollars. This is how much change in, in, in bond uh, holding. And this show you the change in, uh, in money on the, on, the same, on, on the other side. Okay, just to um, quickly just uh, summarize what, what we said here. Um, again, we, we, we focused on the money market. We wanted to study the demand side and the supply side. And equilibrium happened when these both sides meet. So the supply side we, we took as exogenous is given, by monetary, is given by monetary authorities or central banks. And we know now using uh, open market operations, central banks can increase or decrease uh, 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 money supply by entering the uh, uh, bond, uh, 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 bond market as seller or, or buyer. Uh, just as a final note here, and of course that will change the interest rate, the equilibrium interest rate. Just as a final uh, point here, Rather than changing money supply, uh, central banks can actually choose the interest rate they want and then they adjust money supply accordingly. And this is another policy, monetary policy instrument. It's just to use the interest rate as the policy instrument and then based on that, you could actually um, adjust um, uh, money supply accordingly. And that's what typically mo more, uh, most uh, modern central banks do these days. So they choose interest rate and then they adjust um, uh, uh, monetary, uh, sorry, money supply according. Okay, so this is everything I wanted to say today, just focusing on the money market. Do you have any question? So do we understand now how equilibrium happened in the money market? So it's just demand and supply. If you understand demand side, what determines demand and what determines uh, the supply side, then this will help us understanding the um, equilibrium in the money market. So you could read chapter four in the textbook for this lecture. And next time we will see uh, the equilibrium in both markets, uh, how how, what will happen when we bring these both together. Thank you.